Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm super happy to be here uh, and present our work today. Um, this is a joint work with uh, uh, Galois and the company I'm from, Immunant. Um, I'll get into that uh, in a second, but just in case, hmm, I gotta figure out how to switch slides. Huh. Okay, um, just in case you thought this was gonna be a talk with uh, cute cat pictures and gifs and, and jokes, it's not. Uh, <laughs> the work we, we do is, has been funded uh, in part by DARPA and, and they require us to start with this legal disclaimer, so I'm sorry, but this is uh, what I have to show you. The, we asked if we could please talk to f uh, people about this at RustConf and, and DARPA said yes, so that's all the legalese. Um, I have to bore you uh, guys with. So just really quickly, uh, my name's Pierre. Uh, I'm a co-founder at Immunant. Uh, I work with a crack team of compiler and linker experts um, from Denmark originally, if in, in case you wonder why my, my accent is weird. Um, I, I enjoy, enjoy living in Southern California these days. And I'm actually not an expert on Rust. Um, so I have a little bit of imposter syndrome going on today. Uh, my background is mainly in C and C++ exploit mitigation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about how that led us to the uh, C to Rust work. But first, I just want to acknowledge that I'm part of a much larger team. Uh, there's three gentlemen from Galois shown here and three of my colleagues at Immunent uh, that are all crack coders and, and they do much of the heavy lifting. And if you have any really hard questions, I'm gonna defer to uh, uh, Andre who's in the audience uh, today. Uh, there's also some researchers at UC Irvine that helped uh, with this work from uh, uh, Michael uh, Franz and, and uh, Stin Falkert. Um, so with that out of the way, why? Why should you consider even moving your, your well-tested C code uh, to Rust, uh, even, even as awesome as, as Rust is? Uh, it's, I think that's a fair question to, to ask. So I've, I'm showing a, a graph here from the uh, National Institute of Technology's National Vulnerability Database, and it essentially tracks uh, 20 years worth of stats on buffer errors, which is uh, not the only security issue you can have in C and C++ plus code, but it's, it's among one of the most common. So that's the kind of stuff where you uh, under an overflow and a ray index and you access memory that you're not supposed to. And in many cases that's exploitable and all hell could break loose. Um, so uh, as I said, I, I have a background in, in working on C and C++ exploit mitigations where we try to change the way we compile uh, C and C++ code. And, and you can do something to sort of uh, take the lowest hanging fruit off the table to adversaries, but in the end, uh, the pattern is that you come up with a new exploit mitigation and then the adversaries find another way to uh, work around that and still exploit the C and C++ code. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an arms race, really. Um, and, and, and Rust is an attractive uh, uh, migration target. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I won't have to sell you guys on Rust, but it, it does have this interesting property of providing not just uh, type and memory safety, but also freedom from data, data races. So that's, that's like catnip to people that have uh, written a lot of C and C++. Um, so we're, we thought, well, okay, Rust is great, uh, but it's obviously not easy to get into Rust. Is there anything we can do uh, uh, to lower the, the, the barrier to entry there if you have a, a C code base that, that you sort of uh, depend on and must use. Um, so we're, we're, we're gonna be talking about doing two things and the first one is uh, reducing the, the tedium of, of just getting into Rust syntax. I'm gonna show you some really uh, uh, disturbing and, and ugly Rust code later. Um, and that's something you, you, you're gonna wanna refactor into uh, pretty and idiomatic Rust that, that doesn't make your eyes bleed. And as you're doing that, that's gonna be a mostly uh, manual process. So um, uh, we're, we're also gonna do something to try and help you catch errors uh, during trans, uh, ref refactoring into a, a more idiomatic Rust. So this is, this is the grand idea. This is what we pitched um, initially uh, uh, and, and what I hope we can get to uh, one day in the far future. So uh, the main points of notice here is uh, to notice is the, the flow on the top where we're taking uh, untrusted, unsafe C code and we run it through a transpiler and out comes unsafe Rust. It's uh, a syntax driven uh, translation into Rust that basically projects the structure of the C code into Rust and uses C types and it doesn't buy you much in terms of security but at least it compiles with Rust C and that's something. 
Uh, so that's the initial stage uh, from zero to one. And then the latter stages is sort of iterative from n to n plus one, where you have uh, some Rust code that you're not entirely happy with yet, and you want to make it more idiomatic. And you basically have two options. You can either manually rewrite it, or you can hope that we provide some sort of refactoring that can either suggest or do a rewrite for you that uh, improves the, 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 the uh, quality of the Rust in, in, in some way. And in case you uh, uh, are forced to do a manual rewriting, we know that humans uh, tend to make errors. We're not perfect. So what we do to catch those errors uh, uh, is that we cross-check the Rust code you have against the original C program. So we're, we have a tacit assumption here that you want to, at some level, preserve the functionality of what your C programming is doing. So let's say you're, trans, uh, uh, you're migrating uh, a, a decoder. You still want the decoded output uh, uh, from your Rust code to be the same as your C code. So there's lots of opportunities in there to, to, to check the two versions or sanitize them against each other. So we'll talk about that later. But first, uh, transpiling. Uh, uh, the, the things we wanted to accomplish with our transpiler, I'm going to talk about a few other transpilers uh, uh, in a second. So we have some unique goals, uh, uh, partially informed by the experiences of others that, that thought to build a transpiler before us and, and, and inspired us in that way, uh, is that we wanted to do uh, robust C and C++ parsing. Uh, we basically want to handle more than hello world. We want to be able to take uh, huge uh, uh, and crusty old C code bases and parse them. Uh, and we want to preserve the functionality of that code because it's most likely well tested, especially if you care enough about it to move it into Rust. So we've got to preserve the functionality of the code we take in and, and convert to Rust. Um, we also want to, uh, to the extent possible, generate output that's fit for human consumption. Somebody's going to be uh, hopefully refactoring it later. So. I'll, if there's something we can do to not make your eyes bleed, we, we will try and do that. Um, finally, uh, we're also excited about Rust. So we want to write as much as the uh, transpiler in Rust. Uh, and we want to reuse some of the Rust uh, compiler internals uh, on the back end. So first, a hat tip to other efforts. Uh, CoWrote was the first uh, C to Rust trans transpiler. It's uh, written in Haskell in the, by Jamie Sharp. Uh, we met him yesterday. Uh, uh, nice gentleman. Um, it uses the Haskell C parsing library. And because that is less used and less maintained and, and battle tested than, than the Clang uh, C compiler, that leads to certain limitations. But it's certainly an impressive effort uh, uh, for uh, one guy. And, and um, so that's good work. And there's also citrus.rs, which is interesting because it's, it's based on Clang like we do, um, but it's not making any effort to generate C code that will, uh, uh, sorry, Rust code that will actually run right away. Uh, it, it's trying to generate the closest approximation of what, what you would uh, want to write uh, ultimately. So it's, it's, it's merely trying to help you with the syntactical changes. So we sort of slot in between uh, these two by, by uh, handling all C input and also generating something that, that runs and that you can work further on. So our transpiler is kind of a chimera. It's C++ on the front end because of Clang, and then it's Rust on the back end. Um, <clears throat> so the flow is that we take in a bunch of C sources and we take uh, a JSON file that's called compile commands in, which informs us of how the um, compiler was invoked so we can uh, have Clang pre-process the, the C code and then we translate it. And that, that has some interesting uh, uh, consequences that I'll mention briefly later. Um, so all of this is driven by a glue Python script and underneath the hood we have two binaries. One is a C++ binary called the AST exporter. It's fairly boring. It, it merely uh, serializes the Clang AST into a CBOR file. It's a completely arbitrary choice of, of format. And that CBOR file is then uh, consumed by our AST importer. Um, so the AST importer is the, is the most interesting part of the transpiler. Uh, it deserializes the CBOR file. And then that gives you a, a Clang AST, which we re represent in um, in, in, in Rust, and I think we use BindGen to, to uh, make sure that we synchronize some of the um, data structures there. Uh, we transform that Clang AST into our own internal importer AST, and then as a second step, we do a similar transformation, a walk over the importer AST, uh, uh, and build up a, a Rust C syntax AST from the Rust compiler, which means that all this code has to use the, um, the nightly channel because the uh, Rust compiler uh, 
uh, syntax tree is only exposed on the 90 channel um, for now. Uh, in, in, the, in the process of this second stage uh, conversion, we prune uh, C declarations that we don't see being used in the current translation unit because you'll have even in your uh, hello world, uh, you'll, you'll probably have to include uh, a header file uh, for printf. And that, that pulls in a lot of other gunk that you, uh, you, you don't necessarily use. So we prune that out. And we also um, look at loops that uh, contain unstructured control flows such as go-tos. And we try to generate a valid Rust code for that. Uh, so I have a few details on that later too. Uh, but first, pre-processing. Uh, we do our transpiling after pre-processing, and that means that we need to know how to invoke the compiler with the right flags for a given uh, platform. So this is a problem that IDEs always also have an analysis tools. So there's an existing solution where uh, Clang will actually read uh, this JSON file I mentioned earlier. There's an example on, on the right showing the contents. It's very simple. It just gives the arguments to the compiler and, and the build context. Uh, and you can get this file automatically, um, but the way you do so uh, depends a little bit on what build system you have and what platform you're on. So if you're using CMake, great, you just add another flag. If you're not using CMake, uh, Clang comes with a, a script that's called intercept build that you can use uh, for make file projects both on, on Linux and, um, and Mac OS, or you can use Bear on Linux. Um, so there's, there's a few different ways and you gotta find out what's right for your environment. It's messy and C, C lane as usual. Um, so let's get back to transpiling loops. In the simple case where the C code doesn't have any uh, unstructured control flow, we simply uh, generate Rust while loops. So that's fairly simple and straightforward. We generate while loops no matter whether uh, uh, you put in a for loop or a while loop on the C side. Um, in case you have go-tos, things get a lot more interesting. <laughs> So this, uh, this code example, we have a demo. I, I don't know if you've seen it out front, uh, uh, but uh, the Galvegians uh, from Galois, they've, they've been running uh, the demo website, uh, and somebody actually submitted this code example uh, to the demo website, and, and, and we're presenting here for you viewing pleasure. It actually uh, reloops quite nicely to uh, a while loop in Rust. Um, so uh, I'm calling it relooping re because we're using the relooper algorithm uh, by Alon Sakai uh, of the in Inscription project. Uh, they face the similar project uh, problem insofar that they're translating LLVM IR into JavaScript code, which also doesn't allow unstructured control flow. Uh, so we, uh, we reused uh, uh, Alon's work, uh, but we're doing a little bit more because we are interested in, in human consumption of our output where Inscription is simply feeding the JavaScript to a JavaScript compiler. Ho hopefully nobody touches that once it's been uh, transpiled. So we try to um, preserve comments uh, <clears throat> while relooping and, and we also optimize for uh, readability. And, and this, this, is, this is obviously an example where, where it works. All right. So there's a couple of things we can't transpile today. Uh, the one uh, we run into the most is uh, lack of support for variadic function definitions. We can call uh, variadic uh, functions uh, that are external in C code. So we can call printf, for instance, no problem. Uh, there's syntax for that, but uh, there's still a blocking issue on actually having uh, Rust function definitions that uh, have a variadic uh, uh, argument list. Uh, bit fields is also, um, uh, something that we're blocked on, but there's also a Rust RFC for that. So uh, if, if that ever gets implemented in Rust, we can translate it. Uh, I'm not gonna go into long doubles and complex types. Uh, that's a libc, Rust uh, create issue. Uh, but macros is, is something that, 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 that we're not uh, showing in the output because we do the translation after macro expansion. So that means uh, whatever the macros expand to on your platform, that's what the Rust code is gonna reflect. Now, it would be much nicer if you could uh, re re uh, preserve the portability and flexibility of your C code by uh, uh, at least handling uh, macro cases where there is a reasonable um, translation into Rust. So remember that C macros don't operate on, on the syntax tree. They're, they're purely textual replacements, so it's, it's possible for 
uh, a macro to expand to something that doesn't generate uh, a valid syntax tree. And sometimes you have pair of mac ma pairs of macros, begin and end, that have to be used together to get valid C code. So stuff like that is something we don't see uh, ourselves ever supporting in, in Rust. But there's, there's probably a good deal of macros that we can support with reasonable effort. But as of now, we don't. Uh, so this is the web demo. I hope everybody has seen this already now uh, and, and actually talked to uh, people at, at the demo slot instead. Um, but if you haven't, go to c2rust.com. Uh, and you can see that you can either type in your own C code or you can uh, uh, choose from a few pre-baked examples. You can translate it, download the output. Hopefully it runs. Um, and there's also links to the, the source code in, 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 in an FAQ. So uh, we consider this our, our, um, our business card and way to get a hold of us if you want to complain. Um, so if you want to do more than just translate uh, one file at a time, uh, you, you got to clone the software and build it locally. Uh, and uh, it, the way you do that depends a little bit on what platform you are on. So um, some of the, our code is Linux only. So if you're on another platform, I'd, I'd encourage you to either take a look at uh, Docker um, or Vagrant. Uh, we provide scripts. Um, uh, for both, uh, uh, it's, one is a containerization technology and another one is a, a, a virtualization technology. And we provide scripts that will uh, build a Docker or Vagrant environment and provision it such that you have all the right packages in the right places for the uh, Caesar Rust build systems to just function flawlessly. And if they don't, I hope you'll file an issue uh, or write me a sternly uh, worded letter. Uh, so, uh, because it's kind of a chimera, we use Python to glue together the build processes. So you simply uh, run the build translator script with Clang, and that gets you the translator, and you can similarly uh, build all the uh, uh, projects that, you, that are required for uh, cross-checking on the C and C, plus, uh, C and Rust side. Uh, and the refactoring tool is, is pure Rust, so that's, that's uh, uh, built with Cargo the way we uh, know and love. Uh, so, Here's an example of how to transpile. Um, I have a little buffer uh, library that I cloned from, from CLIPS and I removed variadic functions uh, so I won't be embarrassed uh, by warning messages and errors. And you simply uh, use bear to make it uh, such that you get a compile commands a JSON file as you build it and it automatically runs the test suite and prints out okay. Um, so that's just the C code and then you can you can use our transpile.py script to uh, point it to the compile commands and it will look at all the C files and it will run the transpiler on them and it will pick up the main method uh, from the test translation unit because we put a, a pass in the dash M argument. Uh, and then you can simply go uh, into the c 2 rust build sub -tier and run cargo and lo and behold, it, it does the same thing. Great success. So here's, um, here's an example input function from that buffer library that I just showed you. Um, uh, and here is the translated Rust output. So uh, you can see it's not exactly the Rust that a human would uh, write. It's, it uses, it's, it's all unsafe. It uses uh, uh, no mangle. Um, it basically calls malloc just like the C code did. It has the same kind of uh, um, error handling and initializes the allocation after it, 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 it's returned. Uh, you can see uh, pointer accesses are uh, not pretty. Uh, ads, we use wrapping ad to preserve C semantics, so that's also not pretty. And, and there's, a, there's a few superfluous uh, 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 casts in there, uh, or not superfluous, but uh, ideally one wouldn't have, have them in idiomatic Rust. So here's, here's something we rewrote by hand, and you can see that it does the same thing. It's much cleaner and more compact. There's one little change, which is that when we allocate uh, uh, on the heap with Rust, we get zero allocated memory. So this is actually not a semantics uh, um, uh, preserving transformation, and that's why we do uh, refactoring separately, so we can have a program uh, uh, approve these changes rather than just doing them silently. Um, so uh, when we're doing manual refactoring, I mentioned that there's, there's the possibility for, for errors creeping in, so we have a cross-checking tool. Um, to uh, uh, verify that your current Rust version uh, does something similar to the original C code to the extent you want to. So what you gotta do is instrument the original C code and the translated Rust code. Uh, we provide uh, 
uh, plugins to do that. Uh, I'll get to those in a second. And once you have your instrumented C and Rust code, you run both of the programs and you feed them identical inputs um, such that you'd expect them to carry out the, the same computations. And you can see an example here where we have a simple ID function. Uh, what we'll do is we'll cross-check that the function names are the same and that the argument values coming into the function are the same and we'll also, um, also uh, uh, cross-check that they return the same value. So this is a very simple example. It gets uh, a little bit more hairy once the functions are non-trivial. Uh, so you have two options for cross-checking. Uh, one is to do the cross-checking online using something uh, uh, that's called an MVE. I'll explain that in a second, but for now just think of it as a way to execute two processes side by side um, and make sure that they get the same input. So you wanna do this because uh, you don't have to do any logging and the MVE will replicate inputs to the, to the two uh, processes for you. Uh, it does have some drawbacks in the area of, of compatibility. You can, can't take something as complex as a web browser and run two copies and cross-check them with an MVE um, for a variety of reasons that, that I'm not gonna bore you with today. So if, if you can't use an MVE, you have the option of doing uh, cross, uh, offline checking where we lock the program behavior to two log files and uh, if your program is small enough, that's something you can do and you'll, you'll avoid some of the compatibility issues of using MVEs. So, Really quickly, this is a, a fairly uh, large uh, research area, but uh, the idea is you have two variants of the same program. So in our case, it would be a C program on the one side and the translated Rust program on the other side. And as soon as they make a system call, uh, we have a monitoring component that intercepts system calls and forwards them to the kernel. So you can see first we call um, a BRK to allocate memory. And in that case, we wanna allocate memory for both processes. So the monitor forwards both calls. And then later, we uh, make a write system call. And in that case, the monitor intercepts both calls, but it only forwards one of them to the kernel. And it waits for the results, and then it sends the results back to both of the processes. So uh, essentially, uh, the monitor provides the surrounding uh, host with the illusion of one process running, when in fact you have two processes running and doing the same thing, receiving the same input, and uh, the monitor will also cross-check that the two variants produce the same output. So that's how we, uh, we can detect differences in the C code and the run, uh, Rust code uh, online without logging. Uh, so as I said, we have plugins to instrument the code. We have different runtimes based on whether you use MVE-based uh, cross-checking or log-based cross-checking. We have a zeroing uh, malloc uh, replacement. So in case we end up um, cross-checking uh, data that's, that would be uninitialized on the C side, uh, um, uh, that, that does not uh, create any problem for us. Uh, I'm gonna skip the last because we're running a little uh, behind schedule. So here's an example of uh, cross-checking a very uh, simple library that we just transpiled. Uh, we make it again, uh, we transpile it, and this time we add two new flags to the transpile. We add dash x to enable cross-checking and uh, dash u to select the uh, log-based cross-checking. And then we build it again. And we point, I set uh, LD library path to point to our log-based cross-checking runtime. And then I simply cargo run and output, um, I log uh, standard error to a file. And then I, I run the C program, which has also been instrumented because I have a make file target called test that underscore X check, which passes the right plugin parameters to Clang, such that the C code will be instrumented for cross-checking and again, when it's run, I lock the standard error output to, um, to buffer.c.xchecks, and then I simply diff the two, and, and that returns zero, so the, they did the same thing, which is lucky for this example. Uh, so finally, briefly, uh, we, I mentioned that we also wanna do re refactoring. This is the, this is the least um, mature area of our, our work right now, so I'm just gonna show you a simple example where you have um, some while loops, uh, that step from zero to nine and, and with a stride of one and two. And, and we have uh, simple patterns that can recognize that this is better expressed as a, uh, a, a four range loop in, in, in Rust. Uh, this uh, is obviously fairly simple and, 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 and we hope that, that we'll get to a, 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 a substantially more advanced refactoring across files and involving a substantial amounts of, of program analysis to do much more useful things. So uh, if we have a few minutes, I'll just really briefly talk about uh, pie in the sky stuff that we hope we'll be able to do. 
so the main, main feedback we've gotten uh, so far in our project is that it would be really nice if we could do something to generate safer Rust uh, uh, right away or automate some of the tasks. Um, so 100% automation is, is really, really difficult. Um, so I, uh, I have this illustration here that shows that um, uh, the arrows, we're sort of, we're sort of moving on, on, on rings. Uh, and, and without any kind of uh, safety transformation, we're just staying on the outer rings. And what we want to do is we want to bend those rings so we go into a provably safe uh, subset uh, of, of Rust. And the challenges of, of doing so is that we have no, uh, an automated uh, uh, analysis has no domain knowledge. Uh, that's really hard. And then Rust has a substantially different type system. So things like ownership get in our way of, of, of simply propagating types around. So uh, a really quick example here uh, is something I stumbled upon while just refactoring a very simple quick sort example. Um, the partition method uh, function, sorry, uh, calls swap. And this is all done with raw pointers, so there, there are no restrictions on how we can do this uh, uh, as opposed to whether, if we used uh, array slices. So if I start using array slices in my partition and swap functions, uh, uh, I get into a problem because I want to pass two mutable references to the swap function. And that's not allowed under Rust's ownership rules, uh, and for good reason. Um, so that's, that's kind of a bummer for us. Um, so like any sane Rust programmer would, would, would realize that the, the array slice uh, uh, type provides exactly what we need and one should simply use that. Uh, and that allows us to get rid of this, the C code. Hooray, right? It's awesome. The problem is that, that, that we have no domain knowledge in, 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 in a mechanized analysis. So we have to do something. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure what the best solution is, but one thing I could imagine or be convinced that a mechanized analysis could do is, is, is do some, uh, some, some magic swapping where we basically take elements out of, of the array and pass them to swap, both mutable, and then put them back into the array. And what that lets us do is actually preserve the swap function uh, as, as we have it. Uh, so that's, that's one way to get to safer Rust. But it's pie in the sky. It's, it's, it's an open question. If, if somebody has a really good idea in this area, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. And speaking of that, uh, we would love to work with anyone that has C code um, that they want to migrate to Rust because we think the, the, we really need to get some hands-on porting experience to, to figure out where to go from here. Uh, and we need to learn where to focus our effort. So uh, please get in touch if, if, if this sounds uh, like something you care about. So uh, this is the link to the demo website, and, and this is the link to the source code. Please, uh, please go to our GitHub and clone it and open issues if you run into problems. Thank you very much.